Let's say for the sake of discussion, you are a large car manufacturer based somewhere in the good old US of A, and you spent a lot of money and a hell of a lot of ego many years ago, 50 to be exact, to kick the ass three times of another car manufacturer based in Europe. What would you do to celebrate that kind of a milestone? Would you build one of your most iconic cars, named after a horse, in low production, low volume, very high performance and very high price? Or would you call your friends at race car companies and ask them to build a spaceship for the street? In this case, they went with the latter option. So today, you and I are gonna drive that moonshot. Technically, this is a new car, but it still falls under our retro drive review, so let's figure out how to start it. Uh, start button here, it's red. Key is in my pocket. Makes a lot of weird noises on startup. It definitely doesn't sound like any old Ford. Uh, but what reminds you very quickly about a Ford is the rotary transmission gear selector. I am not a fan. But that's it. Let's put it in drive. And I do have to say this. I don't normally drive a Ford, but when I do. Holy crap, this thing is theater. <laughs> you knew it was fast, but oh my God, it's sensory overload. The only way to describe power delivery is it is instantaneous, and the minute you hit 3,000 RPM, it rips your face off. Active Aero, not entirely a concept you and I aren't familiar with. As a matter of fact, we just recently looked at the latest derivation from Porsche in the 992 Turbo S. This many levels above that because it requires a lot of racing hocus pocus and experience to do all this as well as being dependent on information from the vehicle. Uh, the obvious elephant in the room is the wing, and that's dependent on the speed of the vehicle and the mode the vehicle is in. So if it's in a lower speed driving around town, the wing stays in the fixed lower position. If it's in sport or normal mode, the wing stays in the fixed lower position. But if the car were going very fast, or if it was in track mode, the wing comes up to this position. And remember, this is run off the hydraulic system we talked about earlier. It is crazy fast how this comes up. It's almost like a guillotine fast. And then once in this position, it reveals a couple of party tricks. Uh, a gurney flap. Now, we saw a gurney flap in that 992 Turbo S, so that's not entirely new, but what's interesting here is the way the gurney flap works. When the wing is in the lower position, the gurney flap is not extended. It's only extended when the wing is in the higher position. Uh, from what I understand, Multimatic and Ford are trying to patent that. Uh, and just as an aside, uh, we've seen gurney flaps in other cars, but here's an example where one of these, a very old one, was driven by the man himself. Uh, then there's another party trick, and that is an air brake. So again, driving aggressively, hit the brakes hard, like going into a turn. The wing itself will change angle to create more downforce as an air brake. Again, something we've seen in like the Porsches. Now this is all fine and good, but it would make the car unbalanced if there's not something elsewhere in the car that's counteracting the measures in the rear. And here's where we pick up on that theme of racing car with lights because it's not a sailboat, but it has a keel. You ask a Ford with a keel. Uh, you see, what's going on here is the keel works in conjunction with other bits underneath the car to create downforce in the front of the vehicle to balance the downforce from the rear wing. Now, this is where it gets very interesting. So this is a front under tray, uh, and it is controlled by the hydraulic system. Uh, but what this does, it gives the car the opportunity to make it less aerodynamically efficient going through the air by keeping these coal chutes in the front under tray open. So think low speeds or in like normal mode. But when it goes into track mode, these coal chutes, they close like at the blink of an eye because of that hydraulic system. And then it forces the air to go underneath the vehicle and interact with the keel. And that keel sits in front of 
the passenger compartment, but in between the suspension. So let's go back to those unequal length control arms. And like a Porsche or a Mercedes, they're this long. In this thing, they're this long, like a race car, because they have to extend to the keel, enabling the keel to cut through the wind, like in water, it would cut through the water. But here, being in front of that passenger compartment, it roots the air up over these fins that work in conjunction with the keel that create the downforce and then run the air around the passenger compartment through these, the only way to describe them are tunnels that are ducted through the doors and exit out to the side sills below the doors. Oh my God. <laughs> there is no lateral movement side to side. There's even a confidence this thing pushes you to a limit you didn't think you really had, especially in a car of this value and this size. Like for example, I'm coming in here, not on the brake at all, a little power to come out, Jesus. This, you know, it's the funniest thing. The harder you push it, you think you need to brake sooner than you actually do. I would argue that has nothing to do with the lump back there or the braking system. It's everything to do with the stability that's built into the active arrow, specifically that keel up front that works in conjunction with the wing out back. You hear the noise down there? It sounds like a Gatling gun underneath your car. Uh, that is the downside of the active arrow. That is why you want the entire car covered with wrap because literally it is a gun barrel through that arrow chamber there. And it's like a vacuum picking up all the dirt on the road. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play our newest game, Options Game Senior. That's the game where we go through the prices of the cars when they were new, if that information was still available, and compare it with the value of the vehicle today, as stated by our good friend Dave Kinney, who literally writes the book on classic car values. I do want to point something out very interesting before we get into this round of the game, something I have never seen before. The window sticker for this vehicle, which we still have, is contained in this lovely folder that has its own envelope, so you can store this very valuable window sticker. You will find out how valuable in just a minute. So with that, let's dive into this round of the game with the 2020 Ford GT for a base price built in $509,200. Put another way, that's a one bedroom apartment in parts of Manhattan, New York City for a Ford. To that we add the equipment group 500A. That is the titanium exhaust, which I thought was standard in 2020, and the 69 heritage steering wheel, $115,000. That's just the package. Again, put another way, that's a decent home in parts of Texas. Uh, then we add the gas guzzler tax, $3,000. Uh, then we add the 69 heritage roundel group graphic package. Uh, that is something that is significantly valuable. We'll get to that later. And that adds also the exterior carbon fiber, which you can see in the six there, $20,000. To that, we add the destination and delivery from the exotic locale of Markham, Ontario, Canada for $3,750. For a total retail price of six. $150,950. Again, for a Ford. Now, this is the part of our game where I'd normally have a heart attack, but Dave is here to save the day. You see, that vehicle is unusual. Uh, you don't generally go and buy one of those by rolling into a Ford dealer. You have to apply to Ford in Dearborn directly. And when I say apply, you don't fill out an app. You have to fill out an application and send in a video explaining why you're special and what you are going to do with your Ford GT. And hopefully you have other classic cars that will round out your collection. 
and then maybe Ford will bless you with the presence of its vehicle for 650 grand. Uh, then there's the fact that these were limited in production. Initially, they said they were gonna build 1,000 units. Uh, it turned out the first year of production, which was 2017, they made 141 units. Uh, and then for all of those 1,000 cars, they received 6,500 real applications when they announced the car even was 500 grand back then. So they upped the allotment by 350 units to 1,350 total units through the 2022 model year. This one is a 2020 model year. Uh, that being the case, that should guarantee some exclusivity. What does Dave say? Well, in the book, he says nothing because the car is so new and there aren't enough sales. See, along with that video you sent, you had to sign a contract with Ford that you weren't going to sell your Ford GT within two years of ownership. So for the avoidance of doubt, you buy the car and you couldn't sell it for two years. That being the case, the two years just came up on the first year of those cars. And he shows a car condition four, which I don't think any Ford GT really exists as a condition four. Let's say this is more of a, a bad Carfax, 800, and $50,000. Put another way, you could take this car from Gallup and Ford, where this one was bought, great friend, Bo Buckman, wonderful guy. Uh, you could crash it into a wall, and it still would be a $200,000 profit. But this one hasn't been crashed into a wall. It is perfect. It has less than 1,000 miles on it. So Dave, when I spoke to him on the phone, because that's how I had to get the information from him, says this car is worth 1.5 million. But then I said, Dave, it's a heritage livery edition. That's where Dave admitted he didn't have enough data to predict what is the ad for the heritage livery. Now he did say there's definitely ad. He even had to call Colin Comer, who owns one of these, and double check with him. He agrees there's an ad. So let's look back as to what the ad may be. Uh, back in 05, there was a Ford GT. It too kind of looked like the 69 car, uh, and they did offer a heritage livery in those cars. But here's the funny thing. No one wanted them back in 05. Everybody wanted the one with the white with the blue stripes, or the red with the white stripes, or everyone really wanted the gray one with no stripes. But no one wanted a baby blue car with orange stripes. Ford dealers couldn't give them away even for the asking price of 140 grand, and you didn't even have to send in a video. Well, this is where the collector car market changes everything. Now fast forward to 2020, those cars that were 140 grand that couldn't sell with the baby blue, they're worth $400,000 today. Now, it's all about low miles for those things, so this is a low mileage car. But if it were one of those red cars with the white stripes or the gray car with no stripes, that would be worth a measly $275,000. So there is going to be an ad here, we just don't know what it is. So again, put another way, this is a situation where the owner went into Gallup and Ford, bought a brand new Ford, and unlike buying an Explorer where it goes down in value 30, 40% the minute you drive it off a lot, this more than doubled the minute he drove it off the lot. Now this owner, a good friend of mine, a fellow pilot, he is a bit of a cheapskate, and I will tell you why. There are two extra options on this car he didn't get. One is a watch. This watch is specific to the car. You order it after you get your car, and it takes the VIN number off your car and is engraved into your watch you are limited to buying just two per car. In other words, you have to be an owner to get the watch. Then you could get a 118 scale model of the car, even down to a display case that has the VIN number of your car and it matches the colors, the wheels, the brake calipers, everything. Because I'm such a giver, I went out and I got the owner a model of his. Okay, and now the opposite of thrust. Something tells me this is going to hurt. Here we go. And break. Oh. 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 
Oh yes. Uh, that's not a Ford pickup, I can tell you that. Let's try it again. There we go. And brake. <laughs> I think this is more a test of the seatbelts than the brakes. Uh, I'd love to tell you there's no fade, there's no pull from side to side. I mean, yeah, there is no pull from side to side. I can't honestly talk to you about fade at all. This is the kind of thing where you'd absolutely need to punish those brakes on a track to understand the limits. But <laughs> I'm sorry, I just can't stop laughing with this thing. It is just so magnificent. You and I are car guys, so we don't find it odd to have a sports car in baby blue with orange stripes. But everybody that I came across when driving this thing looked at me like I had three heads. Why the hell do you have such an odd color on really a very weird car? And it's to signify a number of things. There's the obvious, the 50th anniversary of Ford winning Le Mans. That's where the paint scheme comes from. But they go a bit further here, uh, specifically to this number here that's in the doors, as well as on the inside of the doors. I would say etched into the carbon fiber, but it's kind of the weave of the carbon fiber. Uh, and the number corresponds to 50 years ago, which car won Le Mans. So the cars that were built initially in December of 2016, that was the first month of production for the 17-year cars, uh, that corresponds to the number two car that won Le Mans. This is a 2020 car, so it corresponds to the number six car, and it goes through each year, so it changes with each year of the heritage livery on the 17 through 2020 cars. Now, this being a 2020 car, the heritage livery is a bit different in that there's a black pinstripe separating the orange and the blue, and then the heritage, it changes the interior a bit. In this case, there's a lot of Alcantara, and then there's contrasting stitching. I'll let you guess which colors the contrasting stitching are. The steering wheel and the paddles change a bit. And then last but not least, the plaque on the dash, which corresponds to the last three digits of the VIN of the car, as well as the year of the car. In this case, the code is L for a 2020 model year. Heritage edition, Ford GT. Let's have some fun with the transmission to do that. You got to hit this button down here. Oh, down to second gear, down down real good. Come around this lovely turn here. God, I would say it's more of an oral sensation than it is driving dynamics and pushing this thing harder with this transmission. So easy to use this transmission and you absolutely get to select the gears. It doesn't force you in the gear that it wants. Like for example, if you want to downshift to a lower gear and it's not the best option, it'll let you do it if you want to blow up your own car. But I would argue you want to control the gears yourself here, not just to avoid it bogging. That's really the least of it. It's just so much more visceral experience. Oh my God, with this transmission and you controlling it and letting the computer do it itself. God, this thing is just so good. I cannot believe this is a Ford. So the application for this car was submitted late November, early December of 2018. It went through the halls of justice up at Ford for a while. And ultimately the car was awarded in April of 2019. Shortly thereafter, this torpedo turned up on the owner's doorstep. Uh, it's made of carbon fiber. It has the GT logo on it. It even has a replica of the dash plaque that shows the year L for 2020 and then the last three digits of the VIN of the car. And inside, we were very curious to find out what's going on here. Uh, open it up and it is a special pageantry of buying a car like I've never seen before. Like you hear about like the Q branch at Aston Martin or Porsche Exclusive Manufacture. Those are scenarios where you get stuff like this, but you have to go to the factory. Here, the factory comes to you and you literally can spec the color of the wheels even the color and trim. Like there's all these speed forms of all the different colors complete with the stripes on them. So this is obviously the one of the car we're driving today, the heritage livery, but silver and red, gray with black, that looks pretty cool. 
Uh, and then there's a couple of other ones here. I love the blue with the silver stripes. Uh, solid black, not my favorite. This is kind of cool, perhaps a bit too flashy. And this is entirely classic white with the blue stripes. And then you can pick and choose the color wheels you want, even down to the color of the caliper. So here's the selection on the car we're driving, graphite with the orange caliper in the heritage livery. But here's like silver with orange calipers. That would look pretty cool on the blue car. And then let's say black wheels with a blue caliper on this gray car would look pretty cool. But then there's the details of the color and trim. So the leather, the Alcantara, and the carbon fiber. Let's try to find the one for the heritage livery. Here it is, and that shows the contrasting stitching in the Gulf livery blue with the orange. Ugh. And even the special uh, Alcantara that makes up the heritage package. This I wish more $500,000 cars would do this. Steering is as you would expect. Oh my god. And it's not just the system itself. It's a function of everything probably that active arrow more than anything else. And this is a big deal because this is where Multimatic really shines through. Not so much the folks at Ford. They know dampers. They know race cars. They do this for other companies around the world, and you can absolutely tell all of that learning has gone into not just how responsive the steering is, but the weight of the steering. Like, here's a great example. This is a less than perfect road. It's been redone here recently, and you don't have as much weight in the nose of this car as you do towards the back, yet the steering is perfectly planted, even with those large tires in the front. God, this is so good! So Oh, good. And now the obvious question, why does this car exist? You see a couple of years ago, there were a number of Ford folks sitting around a conference room and they're scratching their heads and they're saying, didn't something really important happen about 50 years ago? Something where we went over to Europe and we kicked somebody's ass. Uh, and then someone over in the corner said, yeah, this like big thing happened. It happened a couple of years in a row. Maybe we should celebrate. Uh, they put off the idea of like an ice cream party, they put off the idea of a pizza party, and they settled on the idea of turning a Mustang into a cross between like a GT3 or a DTM car. Basically uh, a very low production, high performance, very expensive sort of race car for the street. Anyway, they looked into how much money this whole project would have cost and they're saying, well, why would we do that? when for the same money, or maybe even less, we could make a car we could race again at Le Mans. So they created a project, and this, as a proud Arizona State Sun Devil, I am very happy to report that the code name for this project was Phoenix. And it turned into a street car. As we've learned, it turned into a Le Mans car. And now the car, which is built by Multimatic, they sell a Mark II race car. So this has turned into a number of cars. Now, this is all based on a very large event. I am not going to go into details of that because not only can you look up the details of three years in a row of what Ford did to Ferrari, you can now see a major Hollywood picture on the whole story that really is almost unbelievable. It started as a Lola race car, which kind of turned into the Ford GT, which was absorbed later by Multimatic, who makes this car. So it kind of proves the point. Everything old is new again.